ITM recommends that 5 to 20 percent of your overall investment portfolio be placed in precious metals. However, the decision as to how much to allocate is strictly up to you and or your financial advisor. You need to be aware that my opinions may or may not reflect the opinions of ITM trading. In 2008, Americans lost 10.2 trillion in fiat money wealth during that crisis. I'm here to tell you that was not necessary. But I'm also here to tell you that quite honestly, 2008 was just a warning. Welcome to the premier piece in the ITM trading educational webinar series, A Peak Beneath the Skin of the Markets, which is all about enabling educated choices. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading since 2002. Since 1964, I've been a collector and a banker and a stockbroker, so it should be pretty obvious that I have been groomed for this moment in time. And frankly, I'm on a mission. My mission is to convert financial noise into understandable language. In this premier's piece, we're going to go over the foundation of the whole problem. So you need to really understand what is money, fiat money, and the fiat money disease. I'm going to show you that the problems that caused the last crisis are far bigger today and a greater threat. In addition, any current laws makes any wealth that you're holding in the system very, very vulnerable to the next inevitable crisis. But you also need to understand that inside of every crisis, there is opportunity. As long as you are in the right place, at the right time, with the right money. So let's start there with what is money. Really simply put, we needed money to be a barterable tool that we could value and store labor. And we needed it to support several functions called the four pillars of money. So it needed to be a tool of accounting for measure, a tool of barter for trading, allowing a society to specialize, a tool of savings so that if I didn't need to use all of my labor today, I could save it for future use down the road when I needed it. And of course, then I'm going to want the same amount of money to buy the same amount of goods and services. So I need it to be a store of value so that no matter when I use it, I am fairly paid for my labor. Now, many things have been tried over the years. But actually, only gold meets every criteria to be a good money. It's finite, so there's only so much in the ground or above ground. It's indestructible. It's divisible without a loss of value. So gold and silver, too, in any form, is always monetary at its base. It's labor-based. It takes labor and effort to pull gold out of the ground. So it's really a very fair way to value labor for labor. And then finally, all of these things are what makes it have a store of value and be a store of value, which is why it's good money. This is good money gold. Now, the next question is, what is fiat money? Well, the literal translation is by decree. But the bottom line is, is that it's legalized government money. And if a government can say that this is legal, they can also say, nope, can't use it anymore, which is exactly what we saw in both India and Venezuela in November. Now, that is a risk of fiat money for sure. But the disease is actually inflation. Now, why do governments like inflation? Because it causes nominal confusion. Let me explain. If you had a $20 bill 20 years ago, and you have a $20 bill today, nominally they're identical. They're both $20 bills. But what that $20 bill could buy you 20 years ago versus today is vastly different. But for you, you still have a $20 bill. Now, that creates an, an invisible inflation tax, which benefits governments because this is a way that they can tax you more without going through legislation. And you're cooperating. You don't even realize it. It benefits corporations because that nominal normalcy, 20 for 20, 
hides real wage declines because who doesn't know that the average wage never keeps pace with inflation? So think about this. The more dollars it takes, the more we have to work. The more we work, the less time we have to pay attention. So voila, makes them quite easy to get away with. So I'm hoping that you can clearly see that fiat money is not a store of value by design. But gold money is. And you've probably heard the story that 6,000 years ago you could buy a great, a great a suit of armor with a one ounce gold coin. Well, the turn of the century, you could buy a wonderful men's suit with either a one ounce gold coin, which is a $20 gold piece, or a $20 bill. Today, well, a one ounce bullion coin with spot at that moment, roughly 1200 bucks. You can see, you can still buy a very nice men's suit with that one ounce of gold. So can you see that gold is a store of value over time? Anything can happen short term, but over time it holds its purchasing power. And that's why those that understand money own gold. So can you tell me who understands more about money than central banks? And I have this very strong philosophy. You should always do what the smartest guys on any given topic are doing for themselves. So what are the central bankers doing? Oh my goodness, look at this. They are accumulating gold. Is it possible that they might know something that you don't know? Well, what are they saying? What are they talking about? Well, they're saying that there's a global financial system reset on the way. And that's why they're buying gold. It's very simple. But they want to control it. So what's the tool to make that shift and, and set us up for the next crisis? Well, here you go. Just inflate another market bubble out of thin air. Let's see what that looks like. Hello, reflation trades. Now, inflated markets also support that nominal confusion because you open up your 401k statement and as long as, or your brokerage statement, and as long as everything looks okay, you say, oh, all right, well, everything must be okay. But look at this pattern. What, they're, what you're really going on is the greater th fool theory, expecting somebody to pay more than you did. Because does it make any sense for you to pay more or prices rising in the stock market on declining earnings? Or real estate, prices rising faster than incomes can keep up with it. And how about bonds? I mean, I think we all know that the debt, the level of debt and the bonds in this world are absolutely unpayable, and yet you're at 0% or negative interest rates. None of that makes any sense, but they can manipulate these patterns higher, and I want you to really see that because the reality is, is that this is what it is hiding. That nominal normalcy actually hides the decline in the value of the dollar. So even though you had a dollar here, you have a dollar there, this is from the Federal Reserve themselves. They're telling you there's only four cents left in value out of that dollar. And you don't even realize it. But that's actually not why I say that the, crisis, the problems that caused the last crisis are bigger today. Here's why. All of these super inflated prices impact derivatives. And you might recall that in 2008, it was a tiny little mortgage derivative, derivative bubble that exploded and pushed the whole world into crisis. So on derivatives, the value, the current market value is based on the price movement of the underlying stocks, bonds, or other derivatives. So at these very lofty inflated levels, they really can't afford to have a market implosion. When they do, the whole system will implode. Now you need to know any of this is only possible on a fiat money system. It's impossible on a gold standard. 
but this is really how it impacts you because these are derivatives from the most current office of the comptroller of the currency. These are the derivatives, speculative particularly, in the FDIC insured banks. This is from the most current report. And keep in mind that derivatives are opaque, complex, and they're all about leverage, but all they are are big bets. So to set this up in 98, they blocked oversight of the derivative, the over-the-counter derivative market. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in just a second. But in 99, they repealed Glass-Steagall, which had been put in place in the 30s to separate risk-taking investment banks from deposit-taking commercial banks. So apparently in 99, after Greenspan blocked the oversight and allowed banks to self-regulate, sure, sure made a whole lot of sense to me to merge risk-taking investment banks and deposit-taking commercial banks. After all, it gives the investment banks a whole lot more cheap funding your deposits to work with. And I'm going to show you that in a second too. But here's the end result. You had rapid growth in derivatives up until 2007 when it actually started to fall apart. You didn't see it till 2008, but it already started to fall apart in 2007. So the question is, do you really trust Wall Street with your life savings? and particularly in the derivatives. Because according to that same report, 93.5% of these derivatives are over the counter. Well, what that means is that they are either buy or try lateral trades, which means it's a very limited market. And if you think back to 2008, when that market became illiquid, when there was a run on that, those mortgage derivatives, they froze like that. I don't know if you remember this or not, but I certainly do. 24 hours, those markets were locked, done and done. And this is why Warren calls them financial weapons of mass destruction and says that they're lethal. They are. So let me give you a little perspective on the issues that we're dealing with. Because the top four FDIC insured banks in this country hold 91% of U.S. derivatives. But the top nine, the nine largest banks globally, these are their derivative bets, and these are their assets, oops, including your deposits. These are football fields, this is the White House. Can you get a sense of all of these leverage bets, that's bets upon bets upon bets upon bets, to assets? Because it is at extreme levels. Now, it was supposed to be removed, these derivative bets were supposed to be removed from the FDIC-insured banks. But lobbying by the usual players, Bank of America, Chase, etc., ensured that they would stay inside the FDIC-insured banks. This is a bailout and a bail-in waiting to happen, and we're going to talk more about that in a second. But this comes from the International Monetary Fund, so that's one of the top most important banks uh, and bi banking organizations in the world on r systemic risk in the global financial system. And they tell us that Deutsche Bank is the riskiest bank on the planet. Last time I checked, they were leveraged at 40 to 1. But these are U.S. banks, and Lehman, by the way, was leveraged 30 to 1. U.S. banks, Asian banks, European banks. Can you see how they are all connected to Deutsche Bank, who is classified as a universal global bank? These little gray areas in here show you how Deutsche and all of these banks are completely interconnected to every single financial institution and every single financial product on the planet. So when any of these guys sneeze, this next sneeze, the whole world is going to catch a cold, and there is no safe place to run. I'm sorry, there's no safety in community banks, there's no safety in credit unions, there is no safe place because they're, they're interconnected throughout the entire global system. And just one more little piece 
of perspective for you because this is really what we're facing. First of all, the notional or nominal, so we know what that means, value of derivatives is over 2,200 times all the money that flows through the entire world. This is the US GDP. This is the global GDP. And you need a hundred of these against one of these to reflect the bets to the income to pay those bets. Now, can you see why we have so many problems around derivatives? And 80% of those derivatives are tied to interest rates in a zero or negative interest rate environment. This is absolutely an accident waiting to happen. And it's only possible in this system. You can't get this kind of leverage on a gold standard. There's a lot of limitations. And who are the guys that are monitoring all of this and managing it? The same ones that create them and got us into trouble the last time and the time before. And they'll be the next ones to get us into trouble the next time. Now, there's no doubt that this is one reason why central bankers are accumulating gold, because they know what's going on here. But it's still only one reason why I say that the markets are vulnerable. The other are the laws that have been put in place. In the mid-90s, Reg D was put in place, and what that really does is it encourages banks to take more leverage, take on more leverage. And that's what puts your deposits at risk. Because now, as soon as you make a deposit, the bank has the right to sweep that deposit into sub-accounts, and they don't have to hold any reserves against it, and they can use that for more leverage or loaning out or whatever they want to do with that money. So you may perceive that it's yours, but it's not. It's swept into sub-accounts. And they call that deposit reclassification. And let me just show you how easy peasy that is. No fuss, no muss, and pretty much no cost. It takes 30 to 45 days to implement and takes five minutes a day to maintain. And look at all the deposits you don't have to hold reserve for. It frees up an awful lot of wealth for the banks to leverage and play with and risk. But that is also what puts your deposits held in the bank at risk because it's not really yours. You've loaned it to the bank. But you do have to agree to it or it is not legal. So let me show you how they get you to do that invisibly. First off, they have to tell you that they're doing the sub accounts and they're going to transfer funds back and forth, blah, blah, blah. But they make sure you know this will not affect you. It will not affect you. It will not affect you. But yes, they do benefit. They have to let you know. And they can use that for lending or investment purposes or anything they want. If you use the accounts after this notice, so it can be online, you could have gotten a little shiny one sheet in your mail. Then guess what? Legally, you agree to the terms. Those assumptions that that's your money leaves your wealth vulnerable. And frankly, it's only possible on a digital fiat money system. If your money's not in the bank, they can't do it. But if it's in the bank, absolutely, not only can they do it, but they are doing it. If you're not sure, check. Go online and put in deposit reclassification. Ask the branch manager. The teller's probably not going to know. But in addition to that, in 2010, Dodd-Frank was introduced. It was at that time over 2,300 pages. So nobody read what they passed, and it's still being written. That's another story. But in those 2,300 pages, they legalized bail-in. I'm going to explain that now. They tested it in Cyprus, OK? Little out of the way place, all oh, that's just Cyprus. OK, this red line represents typical Cypriots and Cypriot businesses, just the standard public. This black line represents European banks, mostly German and French. Well, look at what happened in here. It's actually based on Greek government debt. But do you think it is possible that the bankers knew something that the average citizen did not know? 
because they got their money out of the Cypriot banks before the bail-in, where they converted deposits into shares of stock in the failing institution. They had no more access to their money held in the bank. And let me tell you, when that happens, you can yell, you can scream, you can po protest, you can do whatever. But what do you do when the computer says no? Who do you go to? What's your recourse? Really, you have none. So after they, kind, they tested this and they saw where they got some pushback, the bank for international settlements, which is the central banker's central bank and the most important bank in the world, came out with a blueprint of how to bail in a failing institution with or without deposit insurance over the weekend. And you can see that it's actually been utilized quite a bit. These are just a few examples. There are many more of what that looked like in Europe, in Greece, Portugal, this happens to be Italy, but they've done it in many other places. And simply put, it allows the bank to convert any of your deposits into shares of stock in a failing institution. Or if you've loaned them money by buying CDs or buying uh, bank bonds, they are allowed to convert that into shares of stock in a failing institution. So why are they doing it into shares of stock? Hmm. Eminent domain laws say that they must give you something. They can take your property, but they have to give you something of equal value. Well, who values the shares of stock in the failing? Oh, it's the banks. OK, but as long as they give you those shares of stock, eminent domain laws are satisfied, and the bail-in is complete. Now, let me show you the wealth transfer map, because your perception does not hold up in a court of law. This came out of a study done by Yale Law on custodial ownership of all products that are held at a bank, at a brokerage, insurance company, mutual fund company, because if you don't hold it, it's held in what's called street name. And you agree to be a beneficial owner down here. But the real legal owner is up here, and that's Seed and Company that was created in the end of the 90s to be the legal registered owner of pretty much every single fiat money product out there. Now, Seed and Company is owned by DTC. And who owns them? Oh, do you recognize any of these names? Because these names are on here are very are the same names are, that are on the uh, other chart that I showed you that is interconnected and at risk in the derivatives market. So it's the same guys. So I want you to just think about this for a second. They created the products, then they got you to pay them for it. You get to pay them to manage these products. They actually own it, so they have the right to put them all at risk. Okay? Because fiat money products are really just contracts. And any contract is only as good as the counterparty to that contract. And these are the guys that wrote the contracts, and I'm betting you didn't read it. And I'm betting that whoever made that recommendation also didn't read the underlying contract, the prospectus. Assumptions leaves your wealth in the markets vulnerable. It really is just that simple. And truthfully, if you don't hold it, you don't own it, regardless of what your perception is. So I really hope that you could see that 2008 was just a warning. That, that fiat money is not a store of value, and by design, it's about getting you to work for less and taxing any savings that you have over time. That's why those that understand money own gold. It's real simple. Plus, you saw the derivative and the leverage levels. We don't even really know the amount at risk, 
But what we do know, there is no flipping way that you can bail that in with depositor savings, bail that out. There's only so much that tax you can get out of, out of people. I mean, there's only so much. So this is really a big reason why central bankers are accumulating gold because they know this is an accident waiting to happen. And honestly, this is why you need gold too. And then finally, you saw the laws that puts your wealth at risk and at jeopardy. And I really hope that you understand that if you don't hold it, you don't own it. And that's why you need to own physical gold that is in your possession and, and silver as well. But you need it in your possession. That, in my very strong opinion and from everything I just showed you, is really why you need to own physical gold. Plus, there's always opportunities. And here at ITM Trading, we have a strategy. And it's based on the one guarantee that I can ever give you, and that is, at some point, all assets and all instruments go to their true value, their fundamental value. Now, in, the, in all those inflated markets, as you saw, we're somewhere in here. So this lies ahead of us. But here's the opportunity when this implodes. Right now, it's your opportunity to convert your fiat money into good money at bargain basement prices. Because if the reset were to happen today, the reset that the central bankers are ta talking about, the minimum level that you would see gold go to is like 10,000 bucks. Now the range is because we don't know what percentage they're gonna cover, but this is your minimum. Well, on the day that I happened to pull this number, it was at, you know, even just say 1,200. It's a bargain because a rising gold price is an indication of a failing, failing currency. So thank you very much, Wall Street, for this gift. And keep in mind, this is not a store of value, but this is finite, indestructible, divisible, labor-based, a store of value, good money. And if you give us a call, we'll talk to you about a strategy that's going to enable you to generate income for the rest of your life, as well as build a wealth foundation to leave as a legacy to your heirs. I really want you to know that we work together here as a team, and we are all here to be of service. And we are all about educated choices. So you have a lot of avenues that you can come and look at our work in the archives, the live events once a month. I've got one coming up for February. But whenever you're looking at them, we are here to be of service. Please share this information with everybody. Everybody needs to know what you just saw today. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we'll let you know when we're doing these live events. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. And seriously, don't get caught looking the wrong way. Give us a call at 888-696-4653. We're all here to be of service. Bye-bye.